All right. Good afternoon. My name is Harry Kresa, and I work at the White House Office of the National Cyber Director. I am Sarah Heipel. I work at the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. And we're really excited to talk to you here today about how our digital ecosystem is going to be a big part of our clean energy transition and how the clean energy transition is going to be changing our digital ecosystem. We are excited to tell you about what we've been learning about uh, EVs, vehicle electrification, and how those lessons are going to inform the broader clean energy transition, and uh, what we are doing in government and how we're hoping to partner with you and the broader DEF CON community to prepare that digital ecosystem for the most ambitious, abundant, and uh, exciting version of this transition that is possible. So uh, we have some early lessons from this process. You may have heard that uh, the Biden-Harris administration is engaging in some generational level investments in our infrastructure, in our advanced manufacturing capacity. Uh, a lot of it downstream from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act. Some of the largest clean energy and advanced manufacturing investments in the history of the United States and around the world. And in that process, we've started to get some early lessons from this uh, breakneck deployment of clean energy technologies. And that is that in many cases, decarbonization is digitization. Clean energy technologies are often much more technically sophisticated, uh, interconnected, and uh, supply chain complex than the fossil-based analogs that they're replacing. We're thusly getting a better appreciation for how the future that we're moving into, powered by clean energy, is going to be capable of much more than just uh, a lower carbon one. It's going to be capable of a near zero marginal cost electricity world, a world where we're going to be able to have software defined grid management, virtual power plants, and a uh, just a much more exciting, resilient, and flexible future than could have ever been possible without those kinds of advanced clean energy technologies. Now, there's also some hurdles between here and there. Uh, the clean energy ecosystem has uh, a lot more new stakeholders, new entrants in it than a lot of traditional infrastructure sectors. We're benefiting from the dynamism and innovation a lot of, of a lot of these new entrants and these smaller organizations, but they also come without the same decades of experience that some of the traditional infrastructure players have. Those traditional infrastructure players often know each other, they know their regulators, they're used to thinking in terms of threats, threat from state-backed actors, threat from criminals, and they're used to thinking about uh, how they interact with each other in a way that the clean energy ecosystem has not had the same time to develop yet. We have also seen that this deployment is happening at uh, the pace and speed that we need to tackle our uh, climate goals, but also at a pace and speed that is faster than a lot of traditional uh, government mechanisms for regulatory uh, purposes, and industry-led and public-private uh, um, standards-building processes are used to operate at. Uh, we also know that, yes, a lot of what we're talking about today is the dynamics in clean energy specifically, but we're entering a wave of physical digital convergence for our entire infrastructure. Uh, there's, as a result, lots of parts of our critical infrastructure that were never designed to be connected to the internet have benefited from a sort of accidental air gap for the last few decades and have never been prompted to engage in the sort of technology modernization and cybersecurity considerations that they're going to need to uh, in the years ahead. And so we have this once in a generation opportunity to kind of put a do over on a bunch of our uh, critical infrastructure to use the clean energy transition as an opportunity to rethink how we build the very foundations of a lot of our society so that it is more capable of that secure, resilient future while being a lower carbon more act. And one of the uh, places in our, in our infrastructure where this is most clear and these dynamics are uh, most prominent is in uh, electric vehicle technology. I'm gonna let my colleague Sarah tell you a bit more about that. Great, thank you. Okay, so in a moment, I'm gonna tell you a bit more about the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. But to begin with, I wanna start from the start, which is that transportation is a leading greenhouse gas emitting sector 
and all of that is led by light duty vehicles followed by medium and heavy duty vehicles. And I think it's fair to say that the federal government, and in this case, the Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, the White House, fundamentally, foundationally committed to reducing and eliminating those emissions. The sales of fully electric and hybrid vehicles are going up. They're starting to approximate the high peak curve. And that is a big part of transitioning to cleaner transportation. Cleaner energy is a part of that. In my office, the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation is the technical lead on the infrastructure build out that's behind that. So a bit more on the Joint Office. We came into being from the bipartisan infrastructure law. We like to say that we're the startup of government, but I'm from startups and that's not true. We are, we are doing government differently though. And I will say that the focus on affordable, reliable, convenient, equitable, and safe is a real thing. We are very focused on that. And we are pretty nimble and dynamic. So the joint office brought in a number of people from the private sector, myself included, and I am fortunate enough to serve as the lead of engineering for standards, reliability, and cybersecurity. I have excellent principals like my principal Brendan Harris for cybersecurity, as well as other folks I've been able to pull in from the private sector, national labs, and other areas of government. The EV charging ecosystem does have a multiplicity of interdependencies. It is, I'm sure, old to deal with that for some areas of government. This is new for this area of government. We'll talk more about that. The private sector has been trying to crack this nut for a while, but if you're in the automotive area, you know probably a bit about electric vehicles. You know that there's the auto manufacturers, there's the EV charging station manufacturers, network operators, application developers, uh, security, operational security, and then of course there's a tie into the utility grid. Add to that the uh, layer cake basically of government from city to state, municipal, tribal, federal. There's a lot of layers that are happening in this. So what the joint office is doing is two things. We are the center of gravity for, excuse me, for security and cyber physical security around the charging infrastructure. And then we are also seeking to create a web of interconnectedness amongst all these devices and all these players. It's interoperability, it's reliability, it's security by design, it's all the principles we cherish from the private sector, from what you all are, are experts on, and we're bringing them into the federal government. Just checking my timer. Okay, so unique infrastructure, unique challenges. As I talked a bit about, as um, all the headlines say, electric vehicle charging reliability has some room for improvement. We're shooting for 97%. I like all lines myself, but 97% is what our law is, and so that is what we're aiming for some work to go on that. I could say so much about all of our efforts there, all the funding, the charging experience consortium, but I'm staying on task for cybersecurity right now. A lot of work for interoperability, data sharing, privacy frameworks, equity, utility coordination that I discussed earlier. But really, why does this matter? So again, fundamentally and foundationally, we need everybody who rides and drives electric to trust the infrastructure. They might not trust the government, they might not know how it got there, they might not know why it's there, but what I need is for my neighbors, I'm a Detroiter, a Detroit city resident, long time, I need for when my neighbors to pull up and plug their vehicle in, for them to know their data's safe, their vehicle's safe, they are safe, they can charge whenever, they can charge in a blackout, they can charge in a tornado, they can trust it. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to help provide trust in the system, to anchor that trust, and to support their ability to ride and drive electric no matter what's thrown at them. So it is very connected, as I was saying, and interconnected at that. So we have a number of different players that come into this. I've discussed a few from automakers, EDSC manufacturers, network operators. Obviously there's applications developers, cellular providers. Quite a lot's gonna happen with the utility grid that I'll touch on, I'll hint to, I'll allude and foreshadow. And hopefully you'll find out more about that in the future if you 
follow along with everything we're doing. And then there's, you know, consumer information, there's informational security and operational security, there's privacy frameworks, and there's the ability for, when I was talking about the layer cake of government, without going too far into it, but often when there's funding, whether it's BIL or IRA funding, it kind of flows from the federal government, they give it to states, or they give it to cities and municipalities for different types of programming, and then those entities select their suppliers, and those suppliers execute and the entities whether they're cities or states or whatever level of government they need to be able to uh, understand what they're procuring from their suppliers ensure excellence in what they're getting from the suppliers the equipment the services being rendered the reliability the slas they need to know what they're getting so a big part of that is what we offer we call that technical assistance in the government I'll talk a little bit more about the types of technical assistance we offer to make sure that underpinnings, so everyone who rides and drives electric can trust the infrastructure, but just want you to keep in mind there's all these parts coming together, and the grid. So this diagram is not really intended to be legible because it's complicated, and that's okay. Complexity is great. Right, there's a number of different players that have a piece of this block diagram, whether they're in the private sector, their utilities, or they're in the public sector, in the Office of Electricity, they're the Vehicle Technologies Office, there are partners in the White House. So what we're figuring out across the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation is what the interplay and interrelatedness of this. So when vehicles are connected to the grid or they're receiving telematic signals about grid services, grid information, that they can trust those signals, they can trust that information, and that the grid can trust those assets and resources. And it's not just vehicles. There's other linchpin technologies, right? There's smart inverters, there's buildings, there's grid type storage, there's a lot of distributed energy resources out there. And the paradigm of how information flows is starting to change. It's not necessarily just the utility issues some command and control things and then your air conditioner does something. We're starting to see that those end devices have mind, or at least they can communicate between each other, right? Think like autonomous vehicles and parathetical communication. That's what's starting to happen in distributed energy resources as well. So we need to make sure that those resources are secure, they can securely and intelligently communicate, they can bring value in a trust chain back up and have revenue grade data and have everything securely webbed connected when they do start to connect to the utility grid. So that's something that the Department of Energy and our partners at the Department of Transportation are starting to think a lot about. So before I turn it back over to Harry, I wanna talk a little bit more about what the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation specifically is working on. So I come from the private sector, which I mentioned, and I like to just keep mentioning because it's still new to me to be in the government. And every time a Department of Energy lab person, I love them so much, every time they say they wrote a report and somebody didn't read it and they're really upset about it, I just want to shake them because when do you think they're gonna read it? I worked at Rivian, I worked at Ford before that, like I slept at my desk, I like would bring the lamp into my desk for when the lights would go off at, at work so I could keep working. Like when people don't have time to read reports, that's kind of all there is to it. There's no report reading time, unfortunately. We're already missing our kids like baseball games. I already don't have any hobbies. Like I, there's no reports. So what we need to do is create tools that make sense and that are, I wouldn't say competitive with the private sector, but like not that, that look good, that, that compete at the quality level of the private sector. So one example of that is, uh, those of you from or around automotive or working on automotive, you probably know that OEMs often have pretty good security teams. So maybe you wish it was a little more or better or whatever, especially if you're automotive though. But they're pretty good, they're pretty big, they're usually divided up. You might even have a PKI specialized team or something fancy like that. But when you look at EBSC uh, manufacturers, network operators, much smaller companies, much newer industry, they might only have, you know, 30 people that work there. They probably do have a couple of systems engineers that are like go bad cybersecurity, but not a lot of them. 
So, expecting one of them to be like a master pen tester and understand how to like run a full star model or like really understand how to do this, how the bandwidth, or have the company be able to pay for a third party excellent pen testing company, like the margin's not there. So what we want to do is create tooling. We also, in my program, different different world of my program, but we have the first, the curtain of energy, direct contribution into open source. We work with the Linux Foundation, the Everest Project, which Perry will talk, not talk about, but we'll flash up in a minute. So through that Everest Project in the Linux Foundation, we are going to amend on a pen testing tool. And what that tool would look like is say you got a great technician, a great systems engineer, and it will provide like a hands-on step-by-step of how to execute a pen test against your system. How do you layer security? How do you look for threat layers? How do you evaluate what you have? How can you find improvements, whether marginal or significant? It will give you like a step-by-step hands-on walkthrough of really, really doing an excellent pen test for your domain, for your system specifically. That's the kind of tooling you need to build. Other things when I talked about, I'm like 100% less reports as a t-shirt I wear at work, but we do need to create frameworks. So frameworks are like the procurement language I talked about before. The suppliers loved it when we put out procurement language. It was like 25 different requirements that you should ask for for cyber and cyber security for states when they were looking for suppliers because they're like, holy smokes, this is way more thorough than we thought the federal government would come up with. That's the kind of frameworks we want. We want privacy frameworks so consumers know that their data is protected at all times. Data should flow, but it should be protected. They should be able to opt out. They should be able to have the right to be forgiven, forgotten, excuse me. Theoretically, that's just Sarah's opinion, but we need to be able to protect their data and their privacy. So that's a framework we're working on. Another is an incident response. Something happens in the value chain, we should be able to know who jumps on it. The supplier should jump on it. Does the city is the city involved? Is the state involved? Is the federal government involved? Is it like an S bomb where we have to go get a subcomponent manufacturer? How do we know where the incident root causes? How do we take action on it? Who's on first? That's the kind of frameworks that we really need. And that's what we're working on right now. Going forward, where do we want to go next? So I can't believe I made it through a whole talk and I only mentioned public key infrastructure ones, I think, so far. So let me mention it several more times. Okay, so my favorite thing ever is public key infrastructure. And uh, we have a lot of activity around this. I have this, this vision, this goal in life, which is to have uh, roaming for plug and charge, a national plug and charge, one might call it. And perhaps you even go to Canada and Mexico, and we just call it a North American plug and charge. I think we're there. So I heard the fella earlier talking about <laughs> injections in the ISO 1511 2 when I walked in, my favorite topic. So we have 1511 2 which has PKI uh, referenced in it, public key infrastructure referenced in it. It's been sort of a hot mess and the topic of heated debate and fighting and infighting and outfighting for years and years and years and years. But it seems like we got it together and there will be a certified trust list that looks like and there's a number of different suppliers and north america have opted in looks like we have the framework together so the federal government because i love public infrastructure so much has done quite a lot to make sure folks can trust us when they ride and drive electric we've done happy path testing we supported it and and rel the national renewable energy laboratory we then did adversarial testing against it, where we shared best and standard practices for adversarial testing. Now we're moving on to more like firmware base. So if you um, have been in the industry, the industry talks about state machines different than I think the public sector and national labs who talk about a state machine. So I think about this as, you know, you need to pull certificates out of your HSM and pull them into your charging controller so you can run your TLS library and then 
know to switch the vehicle from state E to B to start your 1511-8-2 charging controller. Well, every supplier on earth has to do that. And it's just done, everybody has to do it over and over and over again. If we can start creating technologies like that as a commodity and releasing them into open source, or at least creating standard and best practices, I think that'll help speed up innovation and it'll help our North American uh, engineering and manufacturing compete better with other geographies. So we're really working on getting into the weeds, getting down to the module level, then at the device level, then into the cloud level. And I'll just make one last pitch for putting the user first in ChargeX. So I do fund one of the largest consortiums within the Department of Energy called the Charging Experience Consortium. We won't bore you to tears with it. But it's 88 um, private sector partners. So if you are from a company that's not a member of it, we would love to have you. Three national labs. And we focus on the user experience, soup to nuts, everything you can imagine about it. And that's where it all starts. That's where it all ends. Equity, user experience, cybersecurity. And with that, I'll have Harry take us home. Hello. So as uh, Sarah described, we've got some big takeaways here from that uh, complex EV ecosystem that is becoming a more unified one that is providing us this future we want to live in based on uh, providing, creating these stakeholder groups so we know how to navigate all that technical ambiguity, figuring out how to get through standards and guidance processes in a more nimble way, making sure we're ahead of where research is going, where technology is going, so we have the opportunity to mitigate systemic risk along the way. And in the uh, spirit of trying to create these uh, stakeholder communities and that sense of shared strategic direction, today the Biden-Harris administration is announcing its priorities for uh, ensuring the digital ecosystem is ready to deliver on the clean energy transition. And that includes five linchpin technologies that Sarah mentioned in there, which are batteries and battery management systems, inverter controls, distributed control systems like virtual power plants, building management systems, and of course, EVs and EV cybersecurity. But you may notice here that three or four of those first ones there are all co-resident in EVs and EV charging infrastructure. So there's lots of economies of scale here, lessons that you continue can bring forward here from this process. And that's why we need you. That's why we need people like you in the car hacking village to tear these things apart, to show us where the vulnerabilities are, to make these things stronger, and put many eyes and prodding keyboards on it. And it's why we want you to look at open source software stacks that underpin all of these technologies that are going to be critical to the success of the clean energy transition. We want you looking at these. We want your help making sure that they're secure and resilient and able to get us to that future that we all deserve to live in. So please take a look at them, find those holes, let us know how to make them better and make the linchpin technologies and the open source software that they live on possible to deliver us that future we all want and deserve. Thank you.